going back and forth over and over and over again with this, but uh, the primary issues of labor relate to change, once again. Again, think about it. Prior to this huge industrial revolution, uh, most people are not working in factories. Most people are working for themselves <clears throat> or working for very small operations that are family owned. Uh, most people don't have to, aren't working for wages, okay? Uh, because, you know, over 80% of America is still in agriculture. But you get to this, this industrial revolution where uh, the industrial organizations just boom. Uh, agriculture gets to a point where fewer and fewer people are needed to do the farming. And, um, you know, labor is going to begin to experience things that have not been experienced before. And so as a result, there's going to be a desire to see uh, change uh, come about uh, within how labor operates. Because um, prior to this time, every individual just basically negotiated for themselves is how things work. And, and now that you have hundreds, even thousands of people working for the same company, totally unusual, totally foreign. <clears throat> you wouldn't have seen that uh, before, but now that you're starting to see that, it's kind of like, oh, we, um, we, we need to organize here. We need to do something different. So uh, a couple of things here uh, to emphasize. Number one, and I just mentioned this, and that is the idea of individual negotiations. You see that picture of all those workers in the background, but uh, imagine... <clears throat> where every one of those workers had an individual contract with the company that was negotiated one-on-one -on -one. and you never knew what the other people had negotiated <clears throat> so you could be and so and this would be true in some cases you could be working in a factory where you're working for five cents an hour and the guy next to you is working for seven and for some way some reason somehow he was able to negotiate something higher so somebody's doing the exact same job as you, they're just making a little bit more, they have a better benefit, or you're working for a little bit more, you have a little bit better benefit. And so <coughs> this is primarily how things get started is through these individual negotiations. Unions, very early in American history, uh, unions are not looked upon very favorably at all. Um, the government does not see them as legitimate organizations. There is a desire to um, keep unions as illegitimate as possible. In other words, not give them any legal <coughs> um, authority, not give them any legal power <coughs> or, or rights um, because... Um, a lot of things were being controlled by the big corporations and the guys at the top, and they did not want labor to get a foothold in the door, which could disrupt, again, their processes. Again, when we're talking about guys like Ford and Rockefeller and Carnegie and others, <clears throat> we're talking about guys who are kind of like, look, I'm just figuring out this system. I just figured out this assembly line, and it's working really good. If we let labor unionize, how is that going to impact what I've just... <clears throat> so a lot of times it's not necessarily negative reasons for them to push against union, but a lot of it was um, we're not sure what the unintended consequences are going to be if we do allow unionization. Not to mention, here's probably the biggest factor in not wanting unions. So if you're taking notes, you definitely want to write this down. One of the biggest factors in not wanting to, to legitimize unions is because they were considered socialistic. And socialism is highly frowned upon in America. Socialism is highly frowned upon in America. Because America is completely built around capitalism and the free market system. Socialism <coughs> involves government control. And remember, this is a day and age where laissez-faire, hands-off, um, the, the, the 
economic system of capitalism works best when the government doesn't get involved. So socialism is like um, taboo. We don't want any part, and, and unionization was viewed as socialistic because most of your union leaders are socialists. Eugene Debs being <clears throat> one who ran for president five times as a socialist and lost five times, of course. So it's not about how many times you run, it's what party you run for, I guess. So, <clears throat> uh, also, uh, some of the issues that um, that come up that emerge during this time. One is uh, length of workday. <clears throat> this is this is one of the things that um, that labor had been attempting to deal with for quite some time. When you think about the earliest days of factory work, uh, consider this: the earliest days of factory work um, were 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 thought of almost like agriculture. I mean, when does a farmer start working? As soon as possible. Yeah, as soon as it's light out. When does a farmer stop working? When, when it's dark. And so, you know, when factories are started, they basically operate, they start operating off of that system. <clears throat> Especially factories in the north where your only natural light is really from windows. I mean, if you're, if you're going to use like an a, a oil-based uh, lamp system, um, you know, that can get pretty expensive, and so you're better off just working off of, based off of daylight uh, with, with windows. And so, you know, you would work them 12 to 14 hour days, especially during the summer months, because you can get a lot accomplished. Once it gets to be winter time, <clears throat> you're having a hard time pressing for eight hours. So um, the, length, <clears throat> the length of the workday was something that was almost always um, controversial for labor. Uh, primarily, they were primarily looking for a 10-hour workday. That's what labor really wanted was a 10-hour workday. Um, it'll eventually, obviously, it'll eventually become eight, but uh, that's because uh, once electricity comes in, because it's a lot cheaper to light with electricity. Henry Ford, you saw that one <coughs> video on Henry Ford. Remember, as soon as electricity and all that come up, he's like, if you do an eight-hour shift, you can do three shifts, and you can work around the clock. And... Um, <coughs> And people are only working eight hours. I mean, eight hours will eventually come in, but just so you know, labor was looking for an, a 10-hour workday just to try to make that workday manageable. I mean, if you think about a 14-hour workday, I mean, I'm here for 14 hours someday. On game days, I'll be here for 14 hours. So I'll be here uh, 7 in the morning, and I'll go home around 9 to 10 o'clock at night. Okay, that's 13, right? Uh, 12 to 13. <clears throat> so by the time I get home... It's kind of like, okay, uh, what's left for me to do? And especially in the winter months, it's all dark outside, so it's not like I'm going to get things done outdoors. Um, and it's just kind of like, well, I have time to eat and shower and, uh, and, and keel over and die you know, <laughs> by that time. It's time, for, time to go to bed. Oh, wait, I have grading to do. Oh, wait, I have, uh, I have lesson prep to do. Oh, wait, I have, you know. So it gets to be, you know, you know what those, you know, I'm sure you've worked a, a long day before doing something, uh, maybe not for a job, but around the house, and it gets to be, it, <clears throat> it can be a long day, and then you lose uh, lose time for anything that you would need to do. Um, another another uh, issue for labor was uh, wages, and I, I had said earlier that everybody was negotiating uh, wages, and and basically, companies would negotiate wages based on what was the lowest somebody was willing to work for. I mean, think about it. Isn't that what most places are doing? Uh, what's what's the? I mean, what, what are they paying up at McDonald's these days? Just curious. Does anybody know what they're paying at McDonald's? Close to? Give me a rough idea. No clue. I know at Burger King. What's Burger King? A twenty-five. Okay. How about any other fast food places? What are they paying? Any idea? Taco Bell. Subway was paying nine fifty. <coughs> okay, playing nine nine fifty. What's that? That explains the prices. Yeah. Subway. Subway. Yeah, nine nine fifty. Yeah. Um, but you know why do they why do they set prices at eight twenty-five? Why do they, why do they set wages at eight twenty-five? 
because they believe people will work for 825. If they thought that people would work for eight, they would make it eight. If they thought people would work for 750, they would make it 750, right? Um, you know, why does Subway have nine? Well, probably because they can't get somebody to work for 850 at Subway, okay? Um, so in, in a way, this still happens today. I mean, when I sit down and I, I know this is being recorded, so I hope the school board doesn't hear this. No, just kidding, just kidding. Um, <clears throat> but you know, when I sit down and you know, go through my contract, you know, when the teachers sit here and talk about, um, talk about wages, um, you know, in the back of our minds, I'm sure everybody has an idea of what they think they're worth, what they believe that, you know, they're valued. I mean, I have 22 years of teaching experience. I've actually taught at the college level for eight years. Um, I, you know, I have three degrees. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm not trying to make my head big. I'm just trying to say, you know, there are certain things that we do that we hope would, you know, get us paid a certain thing. And we also know what wage would be humiliating to take, you know. <clears throat> but when I was unemployed two years ago, I was willing to work for $10 an hour, you know, uh, doing construction because I needed a job, you know. I needed money. So, <clears throat> and of course, I didn't have a degree in construction, so I had a hammer. That was about it. So uh, I understood not getting paid, you know, what I, I thought I should get paid. So uh, the, this iron law of wages, okay, so the idea behind the iron law of wages is factories would pay the lowest amount they believe people would work for, which I think in essence is the same today. However, we, just, we have a government that has set minimum wage, so we know that people can't work for less than, was it 725? Yeah. Right now? <clears throat> it was 315 when I was in college, so... <laughs> it's, it's been lower. It's been lower. So, but um, th this, this iron law of wages is just simply the idea that companies would pay uh, the least that they believe people would, would work for. And, uh, but, of course, labor, labor wants there to be a set price that everybody's making. If we're all doing the same job, we all want a set price working for the same wage. And uh, definitely wanted that change. And then thirdly here, oh, Fourth, there are thirdly, I, there is a fourthly here. Uh, third is factory conditions. Um, man, uh, ventilation was bad. <clears throat> it's not like I mean this build. Imagine this building without an HVAC system. Okay, there's no there's no vents. Okay, in here there's no heating and cooling uh, system. Uh, so basically, there's no airflow. I mean, I mean you don't. Think about it, but there's actually airflow through this building that keeps air from getting stale and moving. Well, imagine this being a factory where you're constantly dealing with cloth. Okay? Cloth that's being cut. Well, that creates little scraps of cloth, right? Dust, cloth dust yep. in the air. There's no circulation, so this dust builds up. All right? Uh, windows, they refuse to open the windows for whatever reason, maybe because uh, they don't want to let the heat out or maybe they don't want people sneaking out the windows to take a, a break or something like that. Uh, exit doors, in many cases exit doors are locked. Again, they don't want people taking unscheduled breaks. <clears throat> um, safety, there's, you know, if you're working in a factory, look at, look at the boys, sh look at the lack of the boys' shoes, okay? I chose this picture specifically because here's a boy working without shoes. Uh, notice they are wearing hats. Uh, girls would either have their hair cut or girls would wear their hair up in a bun, in a bonnet. Because imagine getting your hair cut in something like this. Boom. Okay? I mean, just, oh, it, yeah. Okay? Notice, notice there's no safety things around the belts. These pulleys are completely out in the open. No safety guards are not wearing any gloves. Not wearing any hard hats, not wearing any safety goggles, no steel-toed shoes. <clears throat> so there was always issues with factory safety. Of course, today the government has an agency called Occupational Safety and Hazard Administration, otherwise known as OSHA, which can go around. They can even come to this building here and walk around and see how are we storing chemicals in this building. How are we, you know, um, using are all of our exits. I mean, actually the fire department deals with all of the exits and stuff like that, but... Um, to make sure that conditions are, are good. 
uh, for and healthy for the workers. It wasn't uncommon. When I, it wasn't uncommon for um, well, all, the 1911 is the one I'm thinking of. There was a it's called the Triangle Shirt Waste Factory fire, killed about 260 women um, <clears throat> because um, they were working in this in this shirt factory. There was so much dust in the air, a spark came off one of the machines, lit the air on fire, and just the whole factory became just became an incinerator. Um, the women went to the fire exit doors. The doors had been locked so that the women would not take unscheduled breaks. So they went to the other fire exits, but the fire exits that went out the window and down a ladder, you had to open it up. Only one woman, woman could go out at a time because then they had to close it so they could get over to the ladder and go down. So it was just one at a time. So, like I said, about over 260 women died in that fire <clears throat> because of those factory conditions. So it doesn't it doesn't really take a whole lot uh, for something like a tragedy like that to happen. So again, labor wants to organize to get their working conditions improved. Okay, uh, there what? How many of you have heard of, of uh, black lung? Okay. What, what is it? Do you know what it is? It's like a disease from inhaling um, smoke or something else that like, tears your lungs. Spe especially coal. Yeah. Uh, coal miners will get black lung. Uh, there was something known as brown lung as well, and it was from working in these textile factories. They would inhale so much uh, dust from the cotton. It would, it, would, it would create brown lung. So, again, like I said, one of the reasons why these workers want to um, uh, organize is because they, they want to improve their working conditions and make them better. And, and it's obvious that, that unions have been successful at improving working conditions um, with what, you, what you're able to see today. Uh, the last thing here is child labor. <clears throat> initially, please understand, initially at the very beginning, child labor was perfectly acceptable because they worked on farms. So what's the difference between a five, six, or seven-year-old working on a farm and a five, six, seven-year-old working in a factory? Nothing, okay, nothing. Uh, however, as, as time goes on, uh, child labor is cheap. It becomes more difficult for men to be breadwinners. Now understand, <clears throat> don't, don't think 21st century mindset here, okay? Understand that in the uh, 18th century, in the 19th century, in their minds, the man is the breadwinner. The man is the head of the home. He's the one that's supposed to meet the needs. And it was becoming very humiliating when men were unemployed, but their children were not. And so there's a, <clears throat> there's a movement <clears throat> to try to uh, eliminate child labor so that men could continue to fulfill the role that... Um, that in their in their value system in the, in that time period uh, could be met, and so this is why you start seeing mandatory uh, education, public education for kids at least up to eighth grade, uh, to give kids something to do. Because if you're going to get all the kids out of the factories, then they become street gangs. That becomes problematic. Um, so eventually, you, uh, you get a lot of public education laws being passed requiring kids to be educated and of course then that prepares them for factory work as well because that's the way the education system was set up but child labor was competing with adult labor um, it, it slowly over time becomes frowned upon and and they work to try to eliminate child labor especially unions as unions grow and grow um, they want to benefit the adult not the child or they, they viewed the way, best way to benefit the child is to benefit the adult so <clears throat> anyway a uh, couple of couple of reasons anyway yeah so labor labor does react to change and uh, we're gonna see from that unionization um, now understand that trade guilds had always existed uh, for quite some time so unions Trade guilds are more like um, organ organizing craftsmen. Like, uh, hey, we want all the carpenters in our town to be a part of this trade guild so that we can 
we can share information and we can all make sure that we're not undercutting somebody severely when it comes to pricing and things like that. So trade guilds had always existed to, to help monitor the, the quality of work in a town or even uh, the pricing in a town so that they were all getting the same amount of work. But over the course of time, those trade guilds become uh, unions where uh, labor may organize, not necessarily based on what type of work you're doing, but just the fact that you are a factory worker. There'll be some that are just factory work only, and then there'll be others that are more like the auto workers union. You know, that, that centers more around auto working. So, um, uh, so you can see from this picture here, this is an older picture of, of a local union in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, the very first labor union was formed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay, so again, if you're taking notes, the very first union was, was uh, formed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 1869, if you want to put down a date there, and it was called the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor. Uh, its its membership was wide open. You didn't have to be a you didn't have to be a worker in a particular trade or anything like that. So you could be a skilled worker. You could be unskilled. You could be black. Uh, you could be female. Um, you could be Irish. Yep. What's that? It was called the Knights of Labor. It's called the Knights of Labor. Actually, I'll take that back. The Irish did have a hard time getting in because the the <laughs> This particular union was anti-Catholic, so uh, <laughs> sorry, no hope for the Irish here. Obviously, that changes over time, but initially it starts out anti-Catholic, so it becomes kind of hard. It's harder for the Irish uh, to get in. But um, yeah, the Knights of Labor will be responsible for what's called the Haymarket Riot, which uh, several police officers are killed from bombs that are set off in in the Haymarket Square in Chicago. Uh, they, they definitely, one of the things you'll find out about these early unions is the fact that they are not afraid to use violence to get what they want, okay? Um, a, second, a second union um, is the American Federation of Labor, otherwise known as the AFL. Maybe you've heard of the AFL-CIO. Um, <clears throat> the CIO, the Con Congress of Industrial Organ, uh, yeah, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. That doesn't make sense. I have to go back. I'm missing it right now. But anyway, the American Federation of Labor was started in 1886, and it was uh, its most prominent leader was Samuel Gompers. Sorry, it just sounds like a Nazi. Because uh, I think of Goebbels every time I hear of Gompers. But uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> Samuel Gompers was the most prominent leader of the AFL. Um, he is also responsible for uh, the Pullman strike, which resulted in the burning of numerous railroad cars and, uh, and destruction of property. It, it took about 12,000 troops to put down the Pullman strike. Um, because of all the violence. And like I said, early on, these unions adopted violent tactics to get change. Because again, I think that's, they, they believe that was the only way to get their message across. Well, when you use violence to get change, how does that make you look publicly? It really gives you a bad public image. It, it honestly does. And so uh, again, not only was the government against unionization, but the public slowly turns against unionization because it's like, man, if this is what unions are about, we don't want any of this going on. So unions have a very difficult time getting legitimization uh, simply because of their own tactics, not to mention the socialistic aspects that people associated with unions. And so um, they were not very fond of, of unions. So uh, some of the labor strategies here, um, you can see these guys picketing. Uh, I've, I've seen my own dad picket before. I know my, my dad worked at a, at a factory up in Minneapolis uh, that built um, very large uh, 
heating and air conditioning units. In fact, they, they installed the heating and air conditioning that went into the Silver Dome down in New Orleans when that, when that was first built. And, um, but uh, uh, picketing obviously is one of those where uh, rather than working, you go out in the streets, you hold up a sign and basically uh, tell the whole world uh, what's going wrong inside the doors and um, and basically refusing to work kind of hoping and again this is the idea here is economic pressure if nobody's working then the guy who owns this place is losing money and if he's losing money maybe he'd be more willing to negotiate with us but then they have what's called a scab a scab is a person that the owner brings in to work in the place of the guy who's out picketing so they learn really quick that if you're going to pick it, you can't pick it outside. So they did. They learned to do what was called a sit-in strike, where you go to work and then you sit down and then you refuse to work. <laughs> and then you lock. Then you lock the doors with chains so the owner can't come in with the Pinkertons or whoever else, and you sit it out for as long as possible. Um, so bring a big lunch. Bring, bring a big lunch, right? <laughs> So, yeah, another, another, uh, another strategy is boycotting. You know, maybe you don't go on strike, but you encourage everybody just to refuse to buy a certain product. Okay, let's boycott something. I know uh, Quentin Tarantino is starting to get a lot of flack. Uh, Quentin Tarantino is a movie director. Um, who has a movie coming out? I probably won't watch it because I don't watch Quentin Tarantino stuff. It's just all gore and violence, and oh. what's the use? Yeah. But um, he he uh, got he got in front of a bunch of people uh, at a Black Lives Matter uh, march and basically called police officers murderers. And so uh, every police union in the country has decided to boycott his movie until he apologizes. And so. There's a you know there's millions of dollars on the line, you know if people feel for the police officers you know maybe they're gonna boycott too and you know Tarantino's movie's gonna flop at the box office because nobody will go because they're they're gonna boycott it that's an example we're not gonna purchase your product um, with the, again economic pressure we're gonna put economic pressure on you to change your mind because what gets these people to fix things well maybe the almighty dollar. Okay, if you're going to lose money, then, um, then we'll do that. <coughs> uh, over here, uh, you can see we have a Chinaman uh, here. He's, uh, it says, the only one barred out. Uh, another example of a labor strategy is using um, legislation. And labor unions were very effective at getting the U.S. government to ban the immigration of Asians into America for a long period of time. Um, once the Industrial Revolution hit, uh, we kept Chinese from coming to America, primarily because when you look at that iron law of wages, who's willing to work for the lowest price? The Chinese, the Chinese were. And so if you, keep, if you keep allowing Chinese to immigrate into the states, then you are eliminating um, jobs from whites and so labor unions put pressure on the government to pass legislation then that would um, ban them from